don't know how to work them at all. Um, <laughs> so my name's John, and I work in a company called Adaptomy, and we do um, educational software for teenagers in schools. This type of thing, they put their answers into the computer, and the computer corrects it all and tells the teacher how to do it. And we took the, the opportunity of the summer holidays to re-architecture a lot of our system. We rebuilt our front end in Angular, and one of the things I looked at as part of that was redoing our CSS architecture. And uh, well, I mean redoing it, we had no CSS architecture before, we just had a giant big lump of CSS, and it was causing us huge trouble, and to be honest, it was kind of embarrassing, like the easiest part in the whole system was often delaying us and causing bottlenecks and things. So this talk is basically just going to be going, I did a bit of online reading and what I decided. And one of the things I noticed or I realized when I was doing all this was um, I started in web development five or six years ago, back when JavaScript was a bit different from what it was now. You know, Douglas Crockford had just released his book, um, Ajax was just getting popular, and the browsers were getting a bit better. And um, back at the time, it was still treated as a bit of a toy language. And I remember I, my first job was in this Java development company, and they were really suspicious of any type of front-end programming at all. They just, like, no, you can't do that. Like, you can't, you have no control over that, you know? And it was a real uphill battle for the first year or two of my career to get the language to be taken seriously. And I think having been through that once before, I noticed a lot of similarities with the, a lot of the bad practice that was in JavaScript back then is still present in CSS. And also a lot of the attitude people have towards CSS is very similar to the attitude people had towards JavaScript back then. Treating it like a bit of a toy language and, you know, we always get the attitude sometimes, oh, I'm, well, I'm a good developer, therefore I don't have to learn CSS, or it's a little bit beneath me to learn it. And that does have knock-on problems with your JavaScript. If, you know, if you're good with JavaScript, you're terrible with CSS, you're going to end up writing stuff in JavaScript that should be in your CSS. And it, it can clutch up your JavaScript a lot. So, um, yeah, so basically, why is there a CSS talk in a JavaScript meetup group at all? Um, <laughs> No, it's a fair question, and the main reason is if the person setting up your JavaScript architecture isn't also setting up your CSS architecture, almost definitely nobody is setting up your CSS architecture. And a good CSS architecture will help keep a lot of clutter out of your JavaScript. I mean, I don't think you can write front-end code without at least sometimes stumbling across a bit of CSS. So um, just to reassure you, what's not in this talk, there won't be any CSS tricks, CSS tree, modern selectors, anything like that. And also, we, these are the technologies we use. We use SAS as a CSS precompiler, Grunt for our build process, and Angular as our JavaScript framework. But I'm going to keep that kind of a talk to minimum. There'll be a couple of code examples here and there, but really I'm going to talk just on the fundamental principles today. So um, what is in this talk? I'll go through the common bad practices you see, and that's probably the main part of it. Once you're able to recognize the bad practices and why they're bad practices, it's, it, they're easy enough to avoid then. I did a bit of online reading what are considered the good practices that are out there, so I'll talk through them, and then what I took from them and what we did ourselves to set up our own architecture. So to start off with bad practices, you know, what's what Douglas Crawford said, if our oh, JavaScript doesn't suck, you're just doing it wrong. You know, <laughs> the same kind of applies to CSS, a lot of people just do it wrong. And there's a very easy test. Do you write your CSS into a file called styles.css, and is that file more than a few hundred lines long? If, if the answer is yes to those questions, you're doing it wrong. And to be honest, if you're writing any code into a file more than a few hundred lines wrong, you're probably doing it wrong. So um, there's a shed out the back of my parents' house. And I think most people's parents have deeds just like absolutely filled with accumulated clutter from like the, you know, as long as I've been alive and probably longer. And you go into it sometimes and you're like, oh, Jesus, I feel bad about this. It's all, rub all sorts of like my old rubbish. You know, my old school books, some old college notes, sports equipment I haven't used since I was a teenager. The same for all my sisters, stuff my parents never use. It's hard to throw any of it out because you don't know. Some of it's good, some of it isn't. Every now and then I make a token attempt to tidy things up, but basically it's just a big pile of mess in the shed. And the shed is completely unusable as a shed as a result because it's just full of crap. And the styles.css file really remind me of that. They're just like accumulated styles that people put in, put in, put in, never take anything out of it, never refactor it. And that's the big problem. That file just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as the project grows. And it's almost impossible to remove or refactor code because you, you don't know, a lot of time you don't know what the code does, you don't know what HTML it affects, so it's hard to take it out. And then something that was really troubling us was new code can often produce unwanted side effects. Um, just to give an example, last March, I 
created a HTML element. I added a class called next to it. It was to bring the next thing in a pop-up box and added some styles. And unbeknownst to me, on some other page, there was some other thing with a class called next on it. And a week later, you get in a bug report that says some page has spontaneously broken. You need to avoid that type of carry-on. Um, so this, this, is, this is an example I stumbled across a while ago. Inability to refactor code. This, I don't know if everyone can read that. I always sit at the back of these things and I, can, I find it hard to read the, the code. But this, it's really obvious what this piece of code is supposed to do. It's called vCenter and it's for vertically centering an element. The way you vertically center an element is you move it down by half the parent site and back up by half the child site and that vertically centers it. Um, only here, instead of saying you know, down 50% and up 50%, it says down 5% and up 5%. Really, really obviously that's a bug that I should fix. So I said, okay, I'll go and fix that. Um, I went to find the element it was affecting, and what happened here was there was a, a margin on the top that shouldn't have been there, so your man put in his vertical center code, it was too low down, twiddled the numbers a bit. Went back up to roughly the correct spot, and I was like, fine, that's done. So I, I say, oh, I'll fix this bug, and I think, oh, hang on, to fix this bug, I have to fix the other bug as well. And that other bug it probably has knock on effects on some other pages somewhere. And this, this turns out like eating a bowl of spaghetti. And I just walked away from it. I said, I can't, I can't handle this. I can't do that. Like, I'm much more likely to make things worse than make things better by fixing this bug. So I end up just having to leave it. And if you're intentionally leaving bugs in your code, there's a big problem. Like, and um, there is just a big problem with CSS in general. People don't apply the very basic programming principles we'd apply in every other language. You know, don't repeat yourself. That's a very simple thing. And, very few people, or at least nobody with any experience, would you know, take a giant lump of JavaScript and copy it into three or four places. Because there's really obvious problems with that. But people do that with CSS the whole time. You know, I want this thing to look like the other thing. I'll just copy and paste the code that's there. There was a study um, a few years ago on the Facebook page, and that color of Facebook blue was declared 261 times on that page. And obviously, I mean, you can't, you can't if Facebook ever decided to use a different shade of blue or reorganize things, it'd be a mess like. Um, and this is a big one, closure. I mean, what's the scope of your style rules? Is every variable a global variable? Is every style a global style? You know, people used to write JavaScript like that, I remember. You know, the var keyword was considered almost optional. And uh, yeah, but you wouldn't write your JavaScript like this now. Don't write your CSS like that either. And this leads to what people call the specificity wars. And I think this is the most common form of development. You put your HTML down onto the page. You look at what styles are on it. Some of them are meant to be there, some of them aren't there. So you write, the ones you want to get rid of, you write a, a more specific selector to overwrite the styles that are there that you don't want. And then later on, somebody else comes along, your styles are affecting their code, so they write an even more specific selector again to override that. And as well as the styles that CSS file, as well as it getting long this way, it gets long, which one, vertical, it gets long horizontal as well. The selectors get longer and longer. And eventually somebody just cracks and uses either inline styles or the important keyword just to get over this problem. The important keyword, it's like saying, this style, this style is important. I want it to override any other styles. Which you might think, oh, that's fine, this style. It'll override other styles. It'll definitely apply here. But then what happens if two styles have the important keyword? You're back to where you started. The, whichever has the more specific selector takes precedence. And it, you haven't gotten rid of the specificity words. You've just kind of leveled them up a bit, you know? And inline styles. Inline styles are really, really useful and really, really tempting on the day you write them because you're picking out the exact element you want to style. The inline style will override the more specific styles. You're thinking, this is, this is perfect. This is exactly what I want. But once you start writing these, you've basically abandoned all notion of maintaining your code because your styles, are, they just be written anywhere now. Like, um, So those are, I mean, those are the main bad practices. So I did... Uh, kind of like a literature review or just reading online of what's considered good practice. There's two main systems. There's object-oriented CSS and there's scalable modular architecture for CSS. They're both pretty similar. If, if somebody is setting up a new project or setting up a new architecture, I'd recommend having a read through both of them. The top one has a Git repository and a series of presentations you can look at. And the bottom one, there's an e-book and a d-book's about a I think, and there's some blog posts you can read, the motivation behind it. Um, what I'll do today is I'll just talk about the second one, Scalable Modular Architecture, just because it's a little bit stricter in its rules, which makes it a little bit easier to present. But uh, there's a large overlap between the two. They're, I mean, I did, they're two different things. I don't say they're the same thing, but the, general, the fundamental principles are the same in both of them. The main one is 
you need to keep a distinction between what's a global style and what's a local style. The same as you would have between, well, you shouldn't have global variables, but global variables and local variables. You need to keep the scope as tight as possible. So this scalable modular architecture says that your global styles come in four different flavors. There's your base styles, which, are, which would be your, the reset CSS a lot of people would use at that, um, irons out browser inconsistencies in margins, paddings, things like that. Um, this goes a little bit further and says, instead of resetting everything to zero and then putting your size on top of that, it just says reset it to whatever value you want it to be. The layout styles are the one where you put most effort into placing, item, placing elements onto the correct part of your page. It'll include a grid um, and whatever else you need to organize your sidebars, your headers, things like that. State styles are what would interact mostly with your JavaScript. So um, if something changes after page load, if a box opens, something enters an error state, you'd add a class which would make the color of the error red or make the box open, whatever it is. And then team styles are kind of optional. They're basically the coloring in of the site. You might roll them into your base styles on a small project, but if you want to have different color schemes, you'd have them in their own separate files. Like we have a different color scheme for transition year students and junior year students and different content from different publishers and things. So it's, it's handy to be able to swap out CSS files like that. And then local styles are where you're going to write most of your styles, where you'll put most of the work in. And basically it's saying each independent component of your site should be its own separate module or its own separate object, which should be namespaced so that the styles you write on that object only ever apply to that object. So by keeping your global styles fairly, fairly small and fairly not changing, and then your module styles can change more frequently because you're working on much more narrowly scoped variables. Um, that's the better system overall. You're much le less likely to have unwanted knock-on effects. So just to give you a brief look at what that looks like, in your site header, the proposal is you just start every class in your header with header hyphen, and then once nothing else on your site starts with header, that should be fine. Any styles you write here will only ever apply to your header, so you've kept the scope nice and narrow, which is what you want. Um, I didn't, we didn't go with this, with this system directly. Let's take my next slide is our own one, yeah. So uh, we didn't go with this system directly. The big problem we had with it, or the big worry I had with it was, there didn't seem to be any mechanism for just adding some style to some element on your page if it wasn't part of a module or if it wasn't, yeah, that's it. Like, um, so if, I, you know, you imagine a situation, your boss comes in or a designer comes in and says, that, that heading there, I want that a darker shade of blue or a little bit bigger or move that text down a bit. There, there, was, no, there was no system for doing that. Um, the proposal, and it goes through this in the book, the proposal is you, when you get a requirement like that, you then refactor your global styles to take account of the fact that your project now requires headers to be, or at least this header or you know, a type of header to be done out a slightly different way than usual. Um, and my worry with that was every minor change is going to lead to a refactoring of the overall architecture and while that contradicts what I said earlier, that there's not enough refactoring, you can go too far the other way and have too much refactoring as well. If someone comes in with a small change and it ends up a big pile of work, um, it's, 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 taking, it's taking the strictness of the system too far. And also, it's based on the assumption that everybody writing CSS in your project will be good with CSS and that you'll trust them to refactor the global styles. And that's not been true in any company I've ever worked in. You know, it might be, so the thing, it, this, as best practice, this is good best practice, but I think it's a tad unachievable in, in a, just in a normal environment. And because the, you know, the aim isn't to produce the ideal platonic CSS file. The aim is to produce a set of maintainable and workable code. So I made a couple of changes to this when I was setting up our architecture. I kept the separate global and open styles. That's a very fundamental thing that any system should have. The main change I did was I just said every page on the site will be its own namespaced object. Uh, like a web page is the fundamental unit of the web. So you should be able to add styles to just that page and they should affect just that page and no other page. That's a good, I think, working system as well because somebody editing a page will have the page open in a browser beside them. So the chances of something coming out horrible or something going badly wrong is pretty narrow. So that's fine. And then pages are objects. Objects are objects as well, but if objects are objects, what are objects? The, the decision was, um, <laughs> is it anything, anything that's self-contained enough to have its own HTML template will also, get, will also get its own CSS file. So like I said, header, footer, sidebar, any kind of pop-up box, um, anything like that really. I mean, if you're, 
familiar with object oriented anything, picking out the things that are independent objects should be fairly straightforward. This next one is quite simple, and I was surprised to not read it online anywhere or for it to not be standard practice. Keep your CSS beside your HTML. Um, when, you're, when you're studying Angular, when you're learning Angular, this is something that gets drummed into you. You've got your HTML views and you've got your controllers which are in charge of manipulating the HTML and keep the two of them glued together. You're always going to have the two of them open together. Keep them stuck together. Other templates will have a controllers folder where all your controllers go and a views folder where all your views go. But no, keep the view and the controller stuck together. But I mean, if, when you're, if you have your HTML open in your editing, you're going to have your CSS open and editing at the same time as well. So keep your CSS, your HTML, and if you're an Angular, your controller, all in one place. So if you're editing that page, you can open up all the things to do with that page, edit that page, look at that page, check that it's fine. And that's a nice, safe, walled environment where you're very unlikely to do anything wrong. Um, the last one I just chucked in, it's not really part of architecture, but write your, if you're, going, you're almost definitely going to be using a grid system. There's lots of online grids you can download and use, but just they're, they're not going to match the requirements of your project. It takes about half a day to learn how to write a grid and to write one, and it's, it's time very well invested. Once you've done that, then you'll, you'll be flexible in the way you lay things out, whereas if you download an online one, it's going to happen someday or other that it doesn't meet your needs, and then you're, what are you going to do? You're going to try and, try and convince your boss that she doesn't want five things across because your grid only does four and six, or are you going to kind of half write your own bit of a grid, you know, where you, you get five things across. It doesn't really, the paddings of things are different from the other one, but sure, it's fine, it'll do. Like, no, just write your own. It's, it's not that big a job. Um, so just to show you roughly how everything looks like, we use this SCSS precompiler um, the useful thing about it is, if you look, this is our forgot password page. It's the CSS for our forgot password page. So at the top, you've got an ID selector for the forgot password page, and then that bracket closes at the very bottom. And that then, when that compiles, it just adds hash forgot password to the front of all the styles. So you don't need to use a precompiler. You can just type that in directly, but it's a little bit handy. It stops you from accidentally leaving one out. Um, and then in the HTML, the forgot password page just has a wrapper div on it with ID forgot password. What's useful about all of this is that this is the only place we use ID selectors in our CSS. It's class selectors everywhere else, and ID selectors outrank class selectors. So you know that when you write something into this file here, that it'll only ever apply to the forgot password page, and that it will always overwrite any of the global styles. So it's a handy development model that, again, you're, you're putting people into a a walled environment where they can work on the thing they're working on without worrying about any external knock-on effects. Oh yeah, keep your CSS behind your HTML. Um, if you couldn't see the last diagram, you definitely won't see that one, but it's, um, you, you can imagine in your head what it looks like. The one on the left is the file structure of the Angular Seed project, which is a popular project for kickstarting Angular applications. And the one on the right then is our own a bit of the file structure from our own pro project. <laughs> and the difference is, when I was writing this talk initially, I was, I, was, I was looking through it and I was thinking, this is all very basic stuff. Is this, is this actually too basic to constitute its own talk? And then I got to this and I was like, look, this is the thing that most people use for kickstarting Angular apps. And there it is, app.css down at the bottom. Like, So while none of this is hard, people aren't doing it either. Like, There's a lot of very bad practice floating around in CSS. <laughs> So just break up your CSS file, put the CSS for each view in with the view, and you have it in there. Because with the other one, if you have your HTML and your JavaScript well formatted and well bound together, and your CSS file is this thing over here that you're kind of afraid to touch in case you break something and, you know, you're going to, if, when you get to layout stuff, you're going to end up writing layout code in your JavaScript because it's easier um, if, if you don't have a proper CSS structure. So the point of an architecture is to make good practice easier and to make bad practice harder. And that's what this type of thing does. So what have I got next here? Oh yeah, so that was I mentioned. Just write your own custom grid. Um, it's much, much easier to edit your own one than to edit a plugin that you, that you downloaded. And you're going to end up, you might save yourself half a day at start of a project by just downloading some grid, but you're going to spend much more than half a day rewriting stuff that you should have written yourself in the first place. If you look at this thing called lemonade.css, there's a series of articles online, this is what we use basically, which just 
take you through the process of writing a grid, and then once you've done that, you'll have finished with a CSS grid that's perfectly usable. Um, oh, so the last thing I'm going to talk about then is work practices. Because architecture, it only enables good practice. You then do still have to actually carry out the good practice. So somebody on your team probably does need to be good with CSS if you have any type of you know, fancy or responsive layouts at all. Um, the thing is no one is, in part, it, no one is in charge of page styles. So once you've got them well blocked off, anyone with any real knowledge of CSS or even with the ability to go to Stack Overflow should be able to type in some styles you change the color of something, change the layout of something a little bit, and then just look at the page, check that it looks fine on the page. There, that shouldn't require any real specialist knowledge. And someone is in charge of global styles. And the main job, once you set up the initial global styles, the main job of this person is to keep an eye on the page styles, review what's happening, and see, see where the refactoring needs to be done. So the difference between this architecture and the the scalable modular system I mentioned earlier is that this is a lot more flexible in when you do your refactoring. You don't need to refactor immediately upon some change request appearing. But that doesn't mean you don't have to do your refactoring. So keeping an eye on the global styles, see, see what code is being copied. If you see common layouts and common things across three or four pages, well then that needs to be combined into a single thing and promoted up to the global styles. So basically, you need to be constantly refactoring. That's true of any type of code. You need to be constantly refactoring your code to keep it current. And keep an eye out for opportunities to stress test your architecture. Because when things are going well, when things are going fine, when you have plenty of time to do something, um, the job is easy. Right? Your CSS is no trouble at all. But um, when you're, it's when you're under pressure. It's when you're busy that you're really dependent on having a good architecture and a good set of global styles. Because that's when bad practice might sneak in. So after, after a period of period of stress or say after a period where you had a tight deadline or something, just go back and have a look and say, what in my architecture did I find irritating? What styles did I want that weren't there? We had, um, was it last Friday? Yeah, last Friday we had, it, it was a fairly simple thing. Um, I think two hours before we were due to deploy the business people, they wanted a new static page explaining they changed some business rules or something. So um, they gave us kind of a MS Paint thing of what they wanted it to look like. And this is exactly what your architecture should be good at. Just type in HTML, your default company styles apply to it. That should go fine. And then it, largely it did go fine. But at the end of it then, we made a point of having a meeting, sitting down and saying, well, what went fine and what didn't? And we had little, little things, lots of little things. So for example, I was talking about grids earlier. We put a lot of effort into our horizontal spacing and horizontal positioning of things but we decided that we didn't have any proper means of vertical spacing. And when we went back to look at the CSS file of that page, there was a lot of you know, margin top 10 pixels, padding top this, just to get things to lay out vertically correctly. So we've kind of concluded our system of vertically aligning things isn't great. And there was a few other small things like that. But the point is just as, as part of your ongoing refactoring, look out for what you're doing badly and what needs to be improved. And if you do that, and if you have a system that you're able to refactor, then that's really the main thing. That's what you need. So I think that's the end. Yeah. So if there's any questions, or they go on to the cards now, do they? I'll go for the cards. Yeah. So thanks very much, John. We'll just get a round of applause for that, I sure, think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cards? Any cards filled out? Questions? No? Geez, I thought people were shy with the microphone before. We've got at least one. Okay. Any cards? I swear I saw Anton writing. Got one here. Can he answer the question? Can I? Uh, or can I give you the microphone just so it goes on to YouTube? Yeah. 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 If that's okay. Yes, yeah, I. Uh, in which situation do you consider we can use the important things? You know, there is some, th there is some uh, times that we can maybe to be cross-browser in yeah. different, so... Yeah, there are some situations. Um, the scalable modular architecture recommends using it for all of your state styles. So those are all of the styles that are applied through JavaScript, basically. If you add a JavaScript class to open a box, that style should always override other styles. So you should use it then. We, we didn't go with that. Um, we just used the ordering of our style sheets to do that. The main situation we use the important keyword is if you're there are places where we ingest HTML.
from various um, different learning systems. The, the questions um, that the kids get asked, they're typed into a kind of a WYSIWYG text editor that puts its own inline styles. And so when you're injecting H ingesting HTML from somewhere else, you have to use the important keyword. And sometimes if there's one place where we override the default behavior of a third party plugin as well, where we use the important keyword. So we don't use it in any styles we wrote ourselves, but where we're trying to override some foreign or external behavior, that's, that's where we use it. Yes, uh, yeah, I have on, on one question, please. Yeah. Uh, do you know if there is other tools like to CSS links that maybe can help you to review your and check your CSS code? There are, um, there are, we don't use them, but I know that they, they do exist, yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. But yeah, I can't, I can't tell you any more than that. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Inline CSS for performance, yes or no? No. Yay. Anything, prefer anything for prefer performance, no until you've measured it and checked whether it's a performance issue. I have never seen a site in my life where CSS was a performance bottleneck. And um, actually, I'm going to flick back a few slides here. I didn't mention it earlier. Do, 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 do. The big reason that these guys only use a single class selector is because a single class selector is more performant than descendant selectors. So if you have a single class selector, that's like saying anywhere you see a class header drop down, apply this style. Whereas if I flick forward to our system here, so anywhere you see an input, I'm picking out the second one there, anywhere you see an input, look up the DOM tree and see if you see a class with input details and then look up the DOM tree some more and see if you see a, an ID forgot password page. So that's much less performance than a single class selector. But like I said, I measured this and our CSS rendering is I think 2% of our overall page rendering speed. So there is no point in trying to optimize something that isn't a problem to begin with. One more, okay. Speaking of performance and CSS, um, if you split all your CSS into lots of small files you, because you want to keep CSS close to its views, yeah. right? Um, would you then bundle them all? You combine them in one file? Oh, sorry, we do. It? Yeah, I, sh I should have mentioned that at the start. Okay. Yeah. So you do like a one global CSS, let's say style CSS, where you keep all of the styles? Yeah, it is. Per, per, per page yeah. or? It is ironically called style CSS as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, and that's a good question, because it's something we're considering. At the moment, it's all bundled together into a single CSS file. We're thinking about splitting it out per page and dynamically, well, we're in an Angular app, so they're called views rather than pages, but they're the same thing, basically, and dynamically loading our CSS with each view. The, the two trade-offs are, is it a bit of a long wait at the start while you're downloading the whole file, or is there a bit of a wait on each page as you're waiting for a, a new HTTP request? So at the moment, we're bundling them all together, um, but the system, the architecture is deliberately set up so that they could be loaded dynamically. And the half decision we've made is when we get to the point that our JavaScript is too big to all be loaded together, when we start using require.js, we'll probably start dynamically loading the CSS at the same time. But at the moment, our JavaScripts and our CSS are just in one file each. Oh. How hard to apply uh, for in this uh, CSS style some timing or uh, uh, change in layout or uh, apply some m more modification? Let's say uh, in this uh, CSS you declare some search panel that uh, has just input box and yeah. button. Yeah. And uh, how hard uh, to apply some uh, specific changes uh, that connected to the specific page. Let's say on uh, one page you have blue search button and on the another you have the same search, bu uh, bu uh, search panel with orange uh, search button, uh, uh, orange button. How, how this modification could be applied in this system? Um, we do that in one or two places and the answer is we kind of cheat. Um, we have on the body tag of every view the name of that page. So what we would do if this, instead of forgot password page, if this was our search button style, what we just would have at the bottom of this is, say on the, if you wanted the search button to be different on your forgot password page, you just have 
Yeah, forgot password page, search button, whatever, just at the bottom. And uh, how often uh, did you face uh, uh, cascading uh, issues? Is it, uh, uh, for now you have cascade of uh, selectors. Yeah. And uh, if you apply some additional uh, CSS class, it will break this cascade. It will break the cascade, yeah. Yes. Um, so at the moment, yeah, so like I said, the only time we break this rule is when we apply something to the body tag. So you can go body dot whatever. And that then is guaranteed to get caught because no other, there's not going to be two body tags on the page. And if your page name is unique, then you're not going to have body dot that page name on any other page either. So where we do need to break it, we do it by applying a selector to the body tag. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks very much, John. No worries.